Hello, I'm Rick Sending. It's Thursday, October 13th, 2016, here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics on the campus of Rutgers University. With me today for the Center on the American Governor is George Zoffinger, who served as the Commissioner of the Department of Commerce and Economic Development in the administration of Governor Jim Florio, and later as the President and CEO of the Sports and Exposition Authority in the administrations of Jim McGreevy and John Corzine. George, welcome to Eagleton. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, let's start with your background. Uh, I know that you grew up on Long Island. I did. Um, you went to Penn State, which we at Rutgers right. won't hold against you. Right. Um, and uh, went into the banking field. So right. tell us a little bit about how you wound up uh, as an yeah, international yeah. banker. Yeah, from, from Penn State, I, I uh, went into the training program at Irv Irving Trust Company in New York and uh, spent a couple of years there and then got an opportunity to come out to the National State Bank. Um, which was in the First National State Bank, actually, which was in Newark, um, in, in the international department. I had been doing a lot of international trade financing uh, in, uh, in New York uh, with Irving. And so after, um, after about five years, I came out and I had an opportunity to, to go into the Asian division of the First National State Bank, which was in its infancy in terms of international finance. Uh, so I traveled Asia for six or seven years. Uh, did a couple of uh, very interesting things uh, in Asia, including uh, the liquidation of the Allied Bank International, which is a consortium bank owned in part by Fidelity Bank, which was by this time acquired by First National State. And then, of course, you know, with all the machinations of the banking business, uh, that, be that eventually became, uh, you know, First Fidelity. And I was asked after a number of years in the Asian division uh, to go over and head the London branch. Uh, and then, um, and then, there were a lot of difficulties in the banking business during those period, and I got the opportunity to head all of international out of London uh, for First Fidelity. Uh, but that was after some real turmoil um, with the financial crisis back in the, uh, you know, in the '89 to '88 to really '91 era. Now, this is not exactly the kind of resume that usually precedes someone who comes into New Jersey state government and politics. Right. How did you wind up as the commissioner of um, commerce and economic development in Jim Florio's right. administration? Right. Yeah. Well, Jim, uh, you know, Jim uh, was very much involved with a committee in Congress when he was a congressman uh, that had to do with competitiveness of U.S. industries, uh, particularly as it related to competitiveness overseas. Um, so I had had an opportunity on a number of occasions. Uh, to work with him, uh, with New Jersey companies and with, uh, w with uh, the banking business uh, to try to promote New Jersey trade and to promote businesses uh, in their endeavors to, to finance things internationally. Uh, so uh, I was in London at the time that Jim got elected. Um, I had, uh, you know, been uh, coming back and forth a couple of times to help with some outreach to business people that I knew uh, in the state. Uh, during the campaign. And you did and this because you and he had formed a, a, a yeah, friendship we, or a, a, I, I, a... Yeah, a relationship, yes. I mean, I consider Jim one of my closest friends now, uh, having worked with him for those years and, 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 and afterward, uh, actually. Uh, so uh, I, I would say that we, at the time, we knew each other pretty well. Um, you know, he knew that, um, you know, he knew what I was doing and what my background was. and. Uh, at the time, I was in, uh, as I said, I was in London. He got elected, uh, and I got a call one day and said, uh, you know, would you consider, and I forget he even called me. Uh, somebody on the staff called me and said, Must have been you, during the transition. Yeah, yeah during the transition. Would you consider being a banking commissioner? And I said, you, you have no idea who you're asking to do that. I am not a regulator type guy. Uh, I'm, I'm strictly a capitalist, and, and uh, anyway. Um, we'll leave it at that. So you turned down the banking uh, yeah, job. Yeah, I said, I said no, but I said, you know, one thing I would be interested in is, is commerce uh, because I, I knew the previous commerce commissioner. Um, he was a decent man. Was and that Bill Medina? No, no, he, he oh. came after me. Oh, he, uh, I'm So I'm we, uh, <laughs> you know, I, and I got a call from, of all people, Alvin Rockoff, who you know is a former chairman at Rutgers. And, mm -hmm. and Alvin was the head of a, um, of a group called the Israel Foundation, uh, the, the New Jersey Israel Foundation, which was trying to promote trade with Israel. And I, it so happened that I was doing quite a bit of financing. And this was during the Arab embargo. 
And we, we got around that. Uh, we were shipping oranges from Tel Aviv to, to the Arab countries, and <laughs> we were doing a, a lot of different types of financing. And uh, he, he, um, you know, he said that he was very interested in getting my help with regard to that. And I found out later it was because somebody had told him that they were going to offer me the commerce job, right? Uh -huh. Which at the time I didn't know. But anyway, Alvin and I hit, hit it off, you know, extremely well, and it, it, and it kind of circled back later in life, um, actually. Uh, so I got a call, I, I guess, when I was in London. Could you come back and meet with the governor? And, and he said... The governor-elect is the governor The governor-elect, as it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> the governor-elect. And uh, he said, you know, would you like to head the Commerce Department? I said, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. And so I actually moved back. My family stayed in London. Um, I had a very good relationship with uh, the new head at First Fidelity, a fellow by the name of Terciano, Tony Terciano. Um, and he said to me, yeah, de definitely go and do that. And, you know, in a couple of years, you want to come back, you, you can come back. And so it was a very amicable thing. And, and I did it basically because I thought it, it would be good for my career because I was very young at the time. I was 40 years old. I consider that very young today, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I figured I'd meet a lot of business people, which I did. Uh, and it turned up to have good opportunities later on. I did see you quoted in one story as saying, um, if something isn't fun, I don't want to do it. Exactly. Uh, did you look at this as something that would be fun? Yes. I, you know, when, when Jim was first, obviously, you know, everybody had, you know, all this um, you know, great feeling of being able to accomplish things and, you know, being able to do things that are good for the state. Um, and, and, you know, Jim always made that a priority in terms of what was best for the state and for the people in the state. So it was, uh, were, I was enthusiastic mm -hmm. about it, uh, you know, uh, just, it, it was just a great opportunity and, you know, uh, it changed me and my wife's life, frankly. Had you been involved at all in any party politics before Oh this? yeah, I was the mayor of a small town in oh. Sussex County called Byram Township, home of Wild West City, uh, which uh, that goes back a long time ago. I was very young. I got involved in that yeah, that's a very completely re by accident. That's a very Republican yeah. area. And, uh, and I was a Democrat and got elected wow. as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the only reason I ran was because uh, when my wife and I were I don't know if this will all be interesting to you, but Absolutely. my wife and I were first married. We had no money. We borrowed everything we could and uh, to buy our house in Sussex County, which is way out there. And I was commuting to New York with the Irving Trust Company. And we, we uh, moved into our house, and the building inspector shows up the next day and says, well, you got to do this, this, and this. And one of the things was railings on a stoop that we had. And I said, well, why didn't you make the builder do that before we got here? And... Uh, we found out later that it was a pretty ongoing thing in the town that the builders were in cahoots with the town and the other thing. So I ran as a um, an anti-establishment candidate, right, which would probably work well today, uh, and uh, got elected. And much mayor. to your dismay, you ended and, up getting and, elected. Exactly. <laughs> and so then I had to answer all the questions about, you know, mm -hmm. I have drainage down my road, I have all these things, right? Mm -hmm. I, and, and I did that for two terms. Yeah. For two, and, yeah. and how would it, how long was the term? Is it two uh, years? Three years. Three years. Yeah. So six, two, three year six terms. years altogether. Yeah. You two, served as a terms. mayor. Yes. Well, yes. then you had some experience yes. clearly dealing with right. local politics. Uh, right. Did you get involved in anything beyond the local level? I mean, you know, you I in, I, uh, I worked. Uh, you know, I was the Democratic County Chair in Sussex County for a couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, and I worked when that was when Bob Rowe was running for governor back in the really Well, he ran a couple of times. 70-something, so, uh, right? Well, actually, he, he and Florio both ran, right? Um, I guess, in, in, the, right. in the 81 primary. Right. Um, yes, that's I, right. I, but I don't think Roe ran again yeah. in, in 85 or 81. So I was involved during that. And, you know, it, during that period, I also met, uh, you know, I, I met a, and established a good friendship with uh, both Jim and with Bill Bradley, too, mm -hmm. uh, and ended up, uh, and ended up, for a couple of weeks going out to Iowa for Bradley when he ran for president. Okay, So, that's so I've been involved mm -hmm. in politics on and off, uh, but uh, my love has always been in the capitalist system uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and business. Okay, uh, so um, you bring this background. Uh, I mean, we now found out a little bit more about your political right. background, which I right. had not known before. Right. Um, that uh, you, you come to Trenton um, after living in London for five years. That must have been quite an interesting um uh, transition. Yes. Um, tell me about the Department of 
Commerce and Econ tell us about the Department of Commerce and Economic Development. One of the questions that I, I, I guess a lot of people have always had is that there seems to be this sort of amorphousness in Trenton about economic, about who's in charge of economic yeah. development. There's the Department of Commerce and Economic Development. There's the Economic Development Authority. There uh, are, all, I know during the Florida administration, there were all kinds of economic development initiatives coming out of the Department of the Treasury, other ones coming out of the Department of Labor. Then there are a whole bunch of different uh, administrations or authorities that give money to various kinds of programs. How does this all fit together, and right. how, how did you approach this in, is your, in your commissionership? Well, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a tough transition for a business person to go into the government, frankly, and to try to run it as a business. Uh, I mean, I, was, you know, I, I was, had worldwide responsibility at First Fidelity. I was you know, living in London. I had you know, a huge operation there, um, and it was an eye-opener to go in, because I was, I'll never forget it, the first week I was there, I'd get to the office at 7 o'clock in the morning, and nobody else is there, obviously, uh, and I would go around with sticky notes, uh, you know, and put them on people's desks, come and see me, come and see me when you come in. Some people didn't get in until 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, and you it's know, not, well, it's not it, a large department. It, it, it never it has so, been a particularly well, large department. It, back in those days, you had, you had the Small Business Administration, you had the EDA, you had, you know, um, a, lo a lot of people. They had the International Trade uh, mm -hmm. Commission, you had, uh, you know, you had a lot now, of different were these, things. Were these people on staff at Commerce and Economic Development, yeah, they or were, were they separate yes. entities? They, no, they were, oh. well, they were separate entities that reported up to the Commissioner of Commerce. I see. Right? So uh, I immediately, obviously, took a, a, a big interest in the um, EDA, the Economic Development Authority, uh, because, you know, it was, I, I, won't, I won't say languishing, I would say that it was, um, you know, it was fraught with good opportunity uh, if you could find a way to introduce some creative financing to help businesses in the state expand or stay. Uh, and I, I really made it my, uh, the major part of my initiative was to concentrate on that. Um, I also, I hired somebody that had a good background in international trade to do the International Trade Commission portion. Um, and I had a wonderful, wonderful woman who uh, was part of the previous administration that stayed on for a while with me uh, by the name of Debbie aguilera Velez, who headed the Small Business Administration part of it. Uh, so we had, you know, we had a good, a mix of, of some new people as well as some people that were there for a long time uh, that, you know, that really, you know, I think were motivated by um, the change in administration and, you know, the, um, the enthusiasm that was brought to that. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, uh, we, we, did, uh, we, we did pretty well in terms of, you know, at least organizing the place and then, and then reorganizing the EDA. I brought in Tony Kosha um, to be head of the EDA, um, and uh, it, it, even, even those things. It was kind of funny because I knew Tony for a couple of years. He was a very young guy at the time. I knew him for a couple of years from my banking business. And he was a lawyer. I was a, I was a banker. And I remember going through the process of trying to get Tony hired. Um, you know, it, so there was there's bureaucracy <laughs> as well as an enthusiasm and, you know, and, and, and a desire to, to do well. Mm -hmm. So it was fun. It was um, fun, actually. Give us some examples of projects that you worked on during the well, early days of the administration. Uh, you know, in the early days, we, we completely restructured how the EDA uh, financed projects, um, what kind of incentives that they gave, uh, and you know what kind of reward the state got in terms of employment and, uh, and uh, economic investment mm -hmm. uh, from the money that we were spending. Uh, so we, we worked on a number of things uh, around the state. Um, Camden, we had some, uh, you know, some initiatives in Camden, which was close to Jim's heart uh, because he was from that part of the, uh, of the state. Um, and we, uh, we did, uh, you know, we, we, I, I think we did a, a good job of basically making people feel as if the state could help them when it came to commerce. Now, that entailed a lot of things, including a constant fight with the uh, Environmental Protection Department, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. which, which was kind of interesting and, and uh, you know, and was not something that I, I was used to at all, um, you know, because, you know, we, we, we would have projects that we thought were good projects that maybe they thought had issues and, the, you know, and it, it ended up, 
in, at times of being something where you really had to work hard at the cooperation. And that was that was the key thing. Do you th can you think of any particular projects that, uh, off the top of your head that well, the, fell into that category? Well, the biggest one was uh, was the Ford plant in Edison. In Edison. That was the biggest one, you know. And we were very successful in getting them uh, to retool and to um, to build trucks, uh, you know, because it was during that era when the, the small pickup truck became a lot more popular than even the family car in in many instances. Mm -hmm. Uh, so uh, they retooled, and that, that was probably one of, one of the biggest, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that we worked on. Um, and you know, it's um, it, it, there were probably a whole load of others that I don't remember, mm -hmm. frankly. Uh, but uh, we we uh, we did did a lot of good work, I thought. The, one of the uh I, I don't want to call it a necessarily a complaint. One of the controversies about um, ac action, about economic development programs, um, is the question of whether the competition between the states is what drives states to provide tax incentives and tax relief and uh, other um, enticements to businesses, or whether businesses effectively extort the states by playing them off against each other. From your experience, how much is it state versus state, and how much yeah. of it is corporate? Look, it, it, that was one of the biggest rubs that I always had. You know, we had we had some advantages in New Jersey, but we still really depended upon New York and Philadelphia as the main metropolises, mm -hmm. and we had to recognize that. So I tried to have good relationships with the economic development officer in the city, um, and and as well as the people in Pennsylvania, um, and you know, I, I I always thought that that was important. But at the same time, if we could get a good business, uh, and by giving an incentive, uh, we did it. But you're often, competing, you're often competing from the other side yeah. with, with South Carolina yeah. Yeah. looking to take a that, business no, from New No Jersey. question. And that's become more prevalent today, I think, frankly, than it was oh. back in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, because don't forget, we get into that period of, you know, we're just coming out of recession. And, you know, there were people that were just trying to make their businesses you know, profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but I think, you know, if, if you look at it, I, I always thought that it was foolish of us to go head to head with other states just on the basis of, uh, you know, of the money that we had to give to businesses because they were smart, the businesses. They, they knew that they could play one off against the other. Mm -hmm. and, and by doing that, they could get more incentives. And I, I, I see today, I mean, although I'm, I'm not particularly involved because I try to not look back on things, but I see today where we're giving incentives and, and I'm not sure we're getting the benefit that we could get. Um, but, you know, that's somebody else's issue today. Now, is it, now, is this the same philosophy that you employed when you were there? For we the, tried. That, for the, yes, we tried. Okay. But at the same time, I don't want to kid you, we, we did try to, to attract businesses here. Mm -hmm. uh, and. The fact that that uh, you know that that the waterfront was developing so quickly uh, was a good thing for for New Jersey. Uh, a lot of financial institutions were moving their back office mm -hmm. facilities over to Jersey City and, and that area. The Gold Coast, and, as yeah, it's exactly. Now and to. Uh, you know, and at, at that time, that was that was something that we did provide incentives for, and we did try to do. But it almost sold itself because New York was is New York. It's great, but it's expensive. Uh, and you know, over in the Jersey City side, you could you could bring your back office for far less cost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than you know than, uh, than than New York. Right, right. So now the first six months of the Florio administration were um, full of actions, um, but very controversial. Uh, the auto insurance reform, which okay. wasn't especially controversial, the uh, assault weapons <coughs> ban, which was. Uh, then the Quality Education Act, uh, uh, tax uh, increases both in the sales tax and, and in the income tax. Um, and there was a significant tax revolt that took place after those six months. What was it like in commerce? What was the response? Uh, we know what the response was of, um, of the sort of the grassroots response that played right. out in the streets of Trenton right. with, uh, with, with uh, protests and so forth. What was the response like in the business community? What kind of feedback were you getting from businesses? It was it, it was um, it, it, incredible. I mean, 
I look back on that time. I said, you know, I, I always said that I really built a lot of character telling business people how good taxes were for them. <laughs> right? um, but, you know, I'm being a little facetious. But you know, at the end of the day, you know, I can remember going to the business roundtable, 25 largest CEOs in the, uh, you know, in the state. And thinking that, well, you know, because at the time we actually reduced the business tax right. and uh, increased the income tax. Well, I heard a real earful from each one of those CEOs is saying, you, you're increasing my taxes. You know, forget about my company, you're increasing my taxes. Uh, so that was an eye opener for me. Um, but, you know, having said that, in, if you look back on it now, so many years later, um, you know, I think Jim is the last governor to actually do the right thing, to actually pay the bills when they're due. And no business person who would ever object to paying your bills when they would do. Uh, so I think, you know, he, he took a lot of, there was a lot of angst. Um, you know, 101.5 was uh, the radio station that, you know, um, had the best uh, economic incentive, I think, to, <laughs> to uh, keep up the battle. Uh, but, you know, I made a good friend there. That Jim Gerhardt, who was on in the morning there, became a good friend of mine for many years. I know he's retired now. But Jim Gerhardt was a very reasonable guy if you went and talked to him. And I always, I always, again, in hindsight, I look back on those years and I said, you know, if only people had been more engaging with explaining, you know, what the position was, I think that the backlash would not have been as great as it turned out to be. Well, my recollection is that you actually went on the air the uh, pretty, rather frequently. frequently. I did. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, we became, we became good friends uh, because I, look, I didn't go in and, and say, you know, uh, I, I didn't apologize for anything. I said, look, this is the reason that we're doing it. You may not agree with it, but you know, people, you know, governments should pay their bills the same way that every family has to pay their bills, uh, you know, by keeping them current. Uh, in New Jersey, the answer since Jim's administration has been uh, to not make pension payments, to borrow money, uh, and you know, and you take a look at the condition of the state today economically, and you know, you, you mentioned South Carolina and businesses leaving. You, you have a lot more of that today, I think, than we did back then. In those days, I think businesses were coming to New Jersey, uh, whereas today, I think, uh, you know, the, the high cost and the uncertainty of the economic situation uh, would, be, uh, would be inhibitors to, to, to that, did, frankly. Did, did you feel that going out and defending the administration, did you feel as though you were defending uh, something that you staunchly believed in? Did you feel as though there were things that you would have, if, if you had been in the governor's office as opposed to down the street at, right. at, an, at an agency that you would have advised uh, the governor to do differently in terms of how this all, this whole package was you rolled know, out? The answer is, I think, yes. I, I mean, but you never know what you would do if you're right in the heat of the battle of that. I mean, I was on the periphery. I was trying to uh, justify uh, the tax increases. I was trying to justify the fact that, uh, you know, we, we have to pay bills as we go. Um, whereas if you're in the heat of the battle, maybe you don't. I think the biggest mistake was on the communication side. I think that it could have commu been communicated more. I'll give you a good example. I was from Sussex County. I told you I was a mayor. And we weren't living there anymore uh, because when we moved back from London, we moved to Lawrenceville. And, but uh, we used to go back to see friends a lot. And uh, I remember going to a, to a picnic one time and <laughs> having a whole load of my friends basically lambast me. I said, well, you know, what are you doing? All this stuff. I can say pretty categorically that the impact of the income tax increase that was put through at that time had very little impact on them individually. I mean, I, I mean, say, because I think it didn't kick into you have to have seventy five thousand dollars in income. Right. And but it, it was. Like, but I mean, was people the, like to think that they were making seventy five thousand dollars up there, but they weren't. But it was the seven percent that they were paying on toilet paper. Yeah, well, that, that, toilet uh, paper was it's it, just silly, you know. I mean, you know, you, but you always, you know, when you when you're trying to to in any crisis, um, and I've done a lot of crisis management because I'm, I'm in the turnaround business today. Any crisis, you have to make sure you don't give people a point that you can't defend that becomes the rallying point, mm -hmm. right? You gotta, you gotta manage that. Um, and, you know, I think 
it's very difficult to say that this was mismanaged, but I think it was undermanaged for sure. You could have, you could have been a little bit more, do a little bit more outreach, because human nature being what it is, if somebody meets you face to face and you explain what you think and do, and they think you're a reasonable person with a reasonable argument, they're not going to go out and say, oh, you're a scoundrel for raising my toilet tax, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. my toilet paper tax. Right. You know, they're not going to do that. So, so um, now, Jim Florio, by his own admission, is a policy wonk uh, and, he's, he's and, and, and not uh, the sort of guy who likes to go out and press the flesh and uh, chat and right. uh, uh, talk up uh, politically uh, uh, the, the, these, these kinds of situations. Um, would, a, would a larger cadre of people going out on his behalf have made a difference? Uh, would... Uh, I mean, how would you have orchestrated such a yeah. thing if you if you basically got a governor who isn't particularly fond of going out and doing what you've just described? Well, I, I can tell you a number of anecdotal stories that you know that illustrate that really well. Um, one being, I can remember. Um, I think it was I think it was the issue over um, Viking yacht uh, in uh, down in South Jersey um, was really being hammered by the increase in the yacht tax, right? I think it was 10% or something like that. And that, and that had not been, uh, that has, gee, they, I completely forgotten about right. this. There, there hadn't been a yacht tax no. before, so right? So okay. I went down, I visited with them, very nice people. Uh, they explained the thing where they're going to have to lay off these workers that, you know, we couldn't compete, you know, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I took it as a course and I said, you know, well, this is silly. We don't want to have these people losing their jobs because we put a tax on that nobody else has, right? <laughs> and and uh, never but forget But wasn't it. the tax meant to be for the yacht owner as yeah, opposed yeah, to Oh, yeah, well, the, the yacht. but it affected sales. Oh, I you see. It affected uh -huh. sales, sure. right? Because right. it would made the yacht 10% more. Uh, look, not mm -hmm. that I'm feeling sorry for yacht owners, I but, understand. <laughs> but still, uh, at, at, in any event, I remember, uh, you know, it, uh, at the time, Chris Palladino was working for the, uh, for the EDA, and we had an EDA meeting, and Jim is in the elevator with me and Chris, and he goes, hey, George, it's always nice to know what my policies are by reading them in the paper. <laughs> a little shot, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I said, you know, but, you know, I thought at the time that, you know, that it was reasonable to be against the 10 percent yacht tax because it was laying off workers that were, you know, working people. Anyway, um, but. What happened to the yacht tax? Anything happened to the yacht <laughs> yeah, tax? Yeah, it got it repealed, and, and those people still thank me by all the, the time. By the Democratic Assembly yeah, or yeah, the legislature? Yeah, think, be, I, yeah be, Jim, I think the Republicans went along with it, I think. Oh, okay. I, I'm pretty sure. I don't, I don't remember what the Jim uh -oh, did. Oh, we may, we may have to fact check that. Yeah, we might have sure. to fact check it, but <laughs> it did get repealed. It did oh. get repealed, and, uh, okay. and those guys still to this day, uh, you know, every once in a while will say, oh, you helped us, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm which is uh, kind of interesting. But it sounds as though it was pretty tough sledding with the business community for the aftermath. It was. The, for no, the, I'm not, not, not going to doubt it. And by the way, you know, the one thing that I <clears throat> didn't enjoy about it was that I thought that Jim was doing what was right. It was hard to explain it uh, because of the, you know, the constant noise that, you know, the toilet paper tax and, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. I thought he was doing what was right. And it... It really, um, I don't want to say hurt me, but it, it made me feel bad that he was getting abused when I think that he really was doing what he thought was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I think that's his character. I think he is a policy guy. I think that he really believed uh, that what he was doing was the right thing to do. And I think in hindsight, you may, may and I, people might not agree with this, but in hindsight, I think he's the last governor that has done, that has paid his bills when they're due. And, and I think I admire that, frankly, and I admire, I admire it a lot. Now, going back to your quote um, that I don't want to do something that isn't fun, if it isn't fun, um, was the reason that you left the administration at the end of the first two years uh, because it wasn't fun anymore? You know what? Uh, I wouldn't say it was wasn't fun. We'll we'll go a complete circle here with Alvin Rockoff. Alvin Rockoff was on the board of the New Brunswick Savings Bank, and the New Brunswick Savings Bank had been taken over by the National State Bank of Elizabeth, and the turmoil hit the 
it hit the fan where banks were really in trouble. And Alvin's uh, told me his investment in, in the New Brunswick Savings Bank since the merger was, uh, was uh, uh, the worst investment he's ever made. And he said, but we're looking for a new CEO. Would you be interested? And I said, uh, well, that's a real opportunity. Did he just actually happen to catch you just at the right time? Exactly, Is that, uh, exactly right. Had I, you intended to stay on? Yeah, I would have stayed years? on. I, I definitely would have stayed on. Um, but, there, you know, it was right at the period, if you look at it, in, in 89, 91, I guess it was 91, where um, banks were getting closed. Howard Savings Bank was getting closed. Constellation was on the closure list. And... They needed somebody with a background in, uh, in turnarounds, which I had, um, because I did a lot of, of loan collecting activity and, and, uh, and restructurings when I was at First Fidelity. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, uh, it, it was an opportunity. A couple of banks in New Jersey were looking for new CEOs. Um, and um, Alvin, you know, convinced me that this could be right. It was the Kane family bank. Uh, it was the Republican administration at the, you know, in Washington. Nick Brady, I think, was the uh, was the the mm -hmm. Treasury Secretary. And I said, they're never going to close the the Kane family bank. Well, uh, they almost did. <laughs> they almost did. Uh, but we got lucky. Uh, you know, we got very lucky because uh, the OCC closed, uh, or the FDIC closed the Howard Savings Bank and couldn't take on any more for a couple of months. And in that couple of months, uh, we were fortunate enough to, uh, to raise some capital. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and where I met a very, another very good friend of mine, Michael Price, uh, who was a big investor out of Short Hills, and helped me uh, you know, do the investment. And we turned the bank around and mm -hmm. sold it to Core States uh, three years later. And at that point, you became rather deeply involved in New Brunswick. Yes, um, Ralph Larson. Uh, the former chairman of J&J &J, uh, said to me, uh, would you kind of take over this DEVCO mm -hmm. and try to, to get it revitalized because it was in a hiatus after, um, you know, Chris Folio ran it for a number of years and she had left, um, was at HMFA uh, under, uh, under... Housing and Mortgage yeah, Finance Agency. Right. Right. So she had left and there was like a two or three year hiatus in there when not much was, was going on. Ralph Larson from J&J &J said, you know, we needed to revitalize it, asked me if I would do it. Uh, I said, sure, if you give me the continuing support of J&J, &J, I'll be pleased to do that. I hired Chris Palladino. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's still there. And he's still there. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Tony Kosher was our lawyer, so it was our team together. Matter of fact, it's kind of interesting because when Jim first got out of, uh, of Drum Thwacket, uh, moved, two, two, he years, actually, two years later, he actually set up a, an office in our building right. uh, with us, you know, and so um, we were all kind of like it was, it was Democrats in exile at the time, <laughs> right? Uh, but it was, uh, it, it, it was back to really being fun. Uh, we, we had a good time. The bank was doing well, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, New Brunswick was doing well. Uh, so everything was everything was kind of good during that period, and we did the World Cup, you know. Which I'm, we'll, we'll get to that we in a minute. Get to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, um, that was the best thing I ever did. <laughs> the, Not me, I mean, the best I fun I ever had. The, um, the the last two, the second two years of the Flory administration, when he was when he and the folks in Trenton were dealing with a veto-proof Republican majority, uh, there was a, a a real change in the atmosphere in Trenton. Um, interestingly, a number of the people that we've spoken to for this archive uh, have said that in, in some respects that was among the more productive eras um, in Trenton, particularly in terms of economic development, that the uh, Atlantic City um, uh, Convention Center, the, yeah. a number of projects in Camden and, and elsewhere came about because of the fact that there was now a combination of, of a Republican legislature and a Democratic governor who found a way to work together to that end. Um, did you feel in, 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 what were you doing? I mean, I, you were here in New Brunswick running this bank and, and getting DevCo off the ground and so forth. Were you part of any kind of a sort of an outside kitchen cabinet to Florio? Did you still have a relationship with the front office? Well, how, how, well I, you they do all knew me. I, I, was all, I was friends with, with all of them. Um, but. Um, you know, I, I, I was working 70 hours a week at the bank, uh, so I, I didn't have a lot of time uh, to do much else, frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, so, but it was a productive period. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, again, 
things settled down a little bit, um, you know, so you didn't have the constant battles, uh, you know, publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the economy the also got, and got the, better. Look, yeah. that's the reason that the bank was doing better. The economy got better. People that had what were bad loans all of a sudden were mediocre loans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you had something that you could, you know, put your hands on to, to, uh, to, to help the bank, mm -hmm. uh, in essence. Uh, okay, so. now you and Jim Florio went out to dinner at a Portuguese restaurant in Newark. We did. Uh, you tell the story. It's a great story. Yeah? <laughs> and it's really a great story. Because you know Jim. Jim, the Portuguese Day Parade, right? Uh, when I lived in London, uh, my kids, who were NFL and Major League Baseball fans, immediately became Premier League fans. And so that they knew the game of soccer, right? And I took them to the World Cup. Uh, before, right in 1990 when I came back. Uh, before I came back, I took them to the World Cup in Italy. And so they really were fanatics about it. And I saw firsthand in Italy, this World Cup thing is, you know, it's crazy, right? Everybody, the whole city stops when the teams are playing. So I, Even if it's not in the World right. Cup. <laughs> so we're, we're at the Portuguese Day Parade, Jim and I, and Frank Lautenberg. Frank Lautenberg was with us. And uh, we stopped in at uh, Tony Siabra's place, um, down in, in the Ironbound, and, and this, the game was on. And I didn't, even, I didn't think it was an important game. I think it was, you know, probably, uh, you know, one of the, the, the friendly lesser teams. Like yeah, that. no, it was, it was a World Cup game. Oh, it was but a it World was, Cup game. It was a World oh, okay. Cup game, but it was, it was, I don't think, one of the big ones, mm -hmm. okay? So, so Jim says, well, you know, what's that? I said, that's what we should have in our state. And at the time, if you remember, there was a lot of controversy about British fans going and rioting, and the, the you know the Russian the, uh, the the British louts I think they used to call them or something like that. Mm -hmm. So we we I said we got to get this. So I said, do you have do you all right with that? And he gave me one of these. <laughs> yeah, now this is so. he's still governor. Yeah, he was okay. governor. All yeah, right, he so. was still governor. Okay. So yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So oh. we, we, uh, now, it, 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 we put it together. What's the, what's the timing on this? Is so this, this was, is, I was still at Commerce. This, this I, was okay. yeah, I was All still at right. Commerce. Yeah, I was still at Commerce. Okay. Um, so uh, we worked for two years. And at the time, as I said, the sports authority didn't want to have them in the stadium because they had all these things about riots and everything else. I said, don't worry. As it turned out, England didn't even make the World Cup that year, right? <laughs> we well, ended even, up. Even if they had, yeah, I mean, you it, could. It's you, much different. But Much you could different. still end up saying, listen, we want the Ireland-Italy game, which is what you <laughs> right. ended up getting. Which is what we got. Um, so, so, I mean, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't the host country be able to say, listen, we want this game to be here? No, that they, game that's there, not the way it worked. It FIFA? was all done by a draw. You oh, know, FIFA, oh, FIFA was, uh, yeah. you know, it still is probably, <laughs> right. even though they've got their problems lately. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so Jim said, yeah, okay. <laughs> and we ended up putting a bid together. We ended up getting seven games. Uh, and I'll tell you, it was the most fun I think I've had in any public or private life. Now, you stayed involved in this after you left the government. Yeah, I was chairman. Government. I was chairman. Of the, you, of, right. of, of the New Jersey... Host committee. I see. Host, Host committee. committee. And so, you had, there were seven games? Seven games. Played yeah, in, seven in, in, games. in the Meadowlands? Yes. Oh, I hadn't realized yeah, that there were that many. it was great. Many. Yeah, it was, it was great. Started with Italy, Ireland, which uh -huh. everybody remembers. The, the, Two and, largest uh, yeah. ethnic and, groups in and I, New Jersey. I, I, I was just in Belfast recently. I was talking to some friends, and we were talking uh, about World Cup. Now that's you know? Northern Ireland. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but we were, t we were talking about we were talking about because there's still Irish soccer fans, although they do like Gaelic football. Um, but he, uh, we were talking about those days, and I was telling him that the biggest problem we had after that game was to get the Irish team to go home. <laughs> Having so much because fun. they had won actually, they, they yeah. had upset Italy, one as nothing, I recall. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. It was um, really great. What what did that involve? I mean, was was that was it a matter of, of hustling up money, hustling yes. up sponsors? Yeah, we did uh, we did we did a couple of things. I mean, the biggest thing was that we had to make sure that the uh, FIFA understood the venue, and we could uh, you know price the venue at the right thing and everything else. So we worked with the sports authority at the time uh, to do that. Then we also uh, worked with uh, FIFA with regard to um, events. We had, you know, we had a number of events. Um, we wanted to introduce soccer to the inner cities. So we had, a, we had a program to do that. And we got very decent support among New Jersey companies, again, who I knew because of my commerce connection, right, um, to help us by sponsoring different events. Uh, and, and, and also, we also had to do the logistics for the teams. Um, you know, we had 
we had Pingree, I think, had the Italians. We had Scanacon. We had the Bulgarians. We had, you know, we, so we had these teams that stayed here for almost a month if, if they didn't lose, mm -hmm. uh, which the Italians went on, went on to the final, as you know. Uh, and so we, we, um, we had to do the logistics for that, you know, and it was fun. It does sound like fun. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of fun. Now, in the meantime, you're running a bank. In the meantime, uh, and, we're running a bank, right? And, and right. you're and you're running Devco, right. Um, right? And as I looked at your resume, uh, there are a whole bunch of other boards and commissions and yeah. agencies and whatnot that you're getting yourself involved in, right? Um, I was young at the time. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, you're still involved in an awful right. lot of boards and commissions yeah. and nonprofits and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but this is a period of time during which. Well, I guess the World Cup, you wouldn't exactly say you were out of public life, but, but it's, uh, I mean, it's not an, it's, yeah, but it I, wasn't I an was appointed really uh, political In the position. private sector. So you're in the private sector all the way up through the rest of the 90s. And then, well, tell us how you wound up at the, at the Sports Authority. Well, <laughs> it's, it's funny how different things come up. Uh, but I was, uh, at, at the time, I, I had had this investor, Michael Price, uh, who invested in the bank. Uh, we sold the bank, he made a lot of money. And at the same time, he had moved on to do big deals like chemical chase merger and things like that. So he was okay. he was a big time guy now. So you're a small but fish. He, and uh, I had, uh, I had this little, there was this little real estate company in Philadelphia, which is a, it was an REIT traded on the New York Stock Exchange that, um, that they had an investment in. And they asked me to go and, and run that. Uh, so I did that for three or four years and sold that to Wellsford, again, at a pretty good profit. And um, then um, I, I was basically doing that, um, considering running for governor at the time, <clears throat> but decided, you know, make money or, or be a capitalist or run for governor. I decided on the capitalist uh, money part. Why? <laughs> you know what? Um, it's a good question. I, I think I would have loved to do it, um, but it just was. It just was not the right time. It just wasn't the right time. I mean, I had I had this business that we were, you know, that, that Michael had asked me to run, that he had an investment in, and I didn't want to leave them out. And so it just wasn't the right time. Mm -hmm. Had it been two or three years later when the sports authority thing came along. So how that happened was interesting. The Ford plant get back to Edison mm -hmm. is going to close. So McGreevy knew that I had worked in the Flurry administration at the retooling and the truck thing. So he and I and Torricelli, uh, who was senator at the time, took a trip out to Ford and outside of Detroit uh, to try to convince them that we would help them if they would retool that plant and, you know, and continue to make cars here, or trucks, small trucks. Uh, it, it, was, it was not successful, but on the trip, McCreevy said to me, he says, you know, the, the sports authority is kind of screwed up. Uh, you know, we need somebody that's got some background, business background, to go up there. Would you mind doing that? I said, I said well, you know, the timing's all right. Yeah, I, I would do that. I, I would have fun. I'll do it for a year or two. And I, <laughs> I agreed to do that. And, uh, you know, it turned out to be eight years of, yeah, we, 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 but we did really well there. We, we did really well. Um, so... I was happy with it. What were the conditions when you got there? What 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 well, needed to be changed or fixed it just, up? It needed a restructuring because it was losing money. Um, you know that that um, you, you know you had a lot of overhead, um, which you know which was you know not being covered by the revenue. Um, the biggest thing I'm I'm no genius. I can tell you exactly what the success is attributable to. Bruce Springsteen, uh, ten concerts in the stadium. And we made the decision at the time. We made two decisions there that I think were instrumental in turning the place around. One, we made the decision to uh, not uh, deal with middlemen when it came to Springsteen concerts. We knew we could sell them out. So mm -hmm. we dealt directly with them and made a lot of money. We made the money that the promoter would have made mm -hmm. in that middleman. And the other thing was that I, I got into a battle and fought for, um, for um, soccer. Um, at the time, uh, I think there was, a, there was a team that was there that was not producing the kind of revenue that we need. They weren't drawing crowds. 
and I said that we were going to put on games among international teams. They objected to that, said that they had an exclusive right. We fought them. We won. Who, that who uh, had an exclusive right? It, it was, I guess it's oh, the predecessors they, of the Red Bulls. Today. The team, was yeah. that the Cosmos? Yeah, was that, it wasn't yeah. the Cosmos at that hmm. time. It was, it was the you. predecessor of the Red Bulls. I but that they was. had an exclusive right yeah, to the to, use of? For soccer. Of Giant Stadium? For soccer. Uh -huh. Yeah, for soccer. Okay. We said no, mm -hmm. fought them, we won, um, and we ended up having great games in Manchester United, Roma uh, versus Real Madrid, um, where I kicked the ball with Pele. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it so gets back to the whole thing of having fun, right? My recollection so is that fun. the game that Pele played was the largest crowd ever, ever at yeah, Giant Stadium. Like, yeah, it was like 80,000 yeah. people. Mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, it was um, it, those two things, Springsteen and soccer, uh, helped us increase the revenue above what we already had with the Giants and the Jets, mm -hmm. you know. And then, of course, we, you know, we had the whole period when we're fighting with the Jets wanted to build a stadium in New York City. Uh, you, know, so. you also had the arena, which right. at, at that time hosted the Nets, Nets for a and while. The Devils. And the Devils. Nets and the Devils. But then along came the, right. pr the Prudential Center. Right. That was during that same period, right? <clears throat> it was during the period that I was there. Uh, you know, again, you know, something that I was I was not in favor of, uh, in favor of, but uh, being down on the food chain, I guess, I, it didn't matter what I thought. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, it is what it is. But uh, somehow now they're you, both gone. Yeah. They're, they're right to the Prudential Center. Yeah. Well, um, the Nets but, are in Brooklyn. Oh, well, that's right. They're yeah. completely out of the state yeah. now. Um, the change, the the the, you know, you're getting old when. You remember when a stadium was built, and right. and and then you're there when they tear that one down and build another one. Right. Um, MetLife Stadium uh, right. came along as the successor to Giant Stadium. Was right. that during your time there, or was that much later? Uh, no, I I oppose that. Uh, I oppose that. I, I, I look at it's it's my feeling that um, billionaires that own football teams do not need state subsidies in order to survive. Did you, did you oppose not, rebuilding the stadium, or did yes, you oppose the yes. state paying to rebuild the stadium? <clears throat> I'll tell you the story. Um, toward the end of McGreevy and the beginning of Cody and then Corzine, uh, we had a deal to sell the racetracks, pay off the debt on the racetracks. Uh, at the time, there was a company called uh, owned by Stronach that was, was doing a roll-up of these tracks around the country. Uh, as more of a media play than as regular. And we had a plan to redo Giant Stadium. Uh, I wanted to take the proceeds from the racetrack sale, put a dome on the existing stadium and do a renovation. We already had hired the architect from that did Lambeau Field. Um, I thought that I had a deal with, uh, with Matt Wellington Mara and Bob Tisch with regard to that. Um, Lehman Brothers came along and told them that they could get financing and uh, you know they went and did their own stadium uh, on our land and got one of the most sweetheart deals I've ever think, think will ever be done in real estate they now have 675 acres in the Meadowlands for six million dollars a year hmm. <laughs> you think about that it's just absurd it's just absurd but as my wife says to me all the time George get over it <laughs> and that's a good thing because I'm not looking back <laughs> Well, let's look back for just a second uh, at, at the, the fact that you now, by the time you had left the Sports Authority, you had served under Governor Florio, Governor Grevy, Governor Corzine. Now, recognizing that with Florio you were in the cabinet, with the other two you were at right. least sort of one step removed up at the Meadowlands, but you must have had some sense of the differences in their management styles, in their uh, focus, in the way in which they ran government. Give us some of your impressions yeah. about how different governors deal yeah. with different issues. Right. Jim, Jim was very much, as you said before, a policy-driven person. Uh, he was very intellectual. Uh, he, was, he was thoughtful in terms of, of any decision, even, even minor decisions. He was very, very thoughtful with regard to that. Jim McGreevy was more of a people person. Uh, you know, Jim Florio didn't necessarily like to go out and shake people's hands and pat them on the back and all that stuff, although he forced himself to do it. Um, Jim McGreevy was natural at it, he, he did it all the time. And of course, I was somewhere in the middle. He, he wanted to uh, obviously be, uh, you know, um, he wanted to be a good governor, but he, he, you know, he wanted to be liked by people, 
but didn't Sometimes have... those two are mutually exclusive, aren't exactly, they? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. You took the words out of my mouth. I mean, and so, you know, you, you can't be, you know. Um, so, um, you, know, I, you know, I admire all three of them um, for doing the job. It's not an easy job, right? <laughs> Uh, so, you, you know, you have to admire them for that, uh, but to totally different management styles, mm -hmm. totally different. From your own reflections, thinking back on this long period of time we're talking about now, from the time you came back from London and, and, and uh, um, walked into Trenton for the first time in, right. in a state position, through all the other experiences that you've had, um, what are your overall impressions of New Jersey state government? Is it a well-run government? Is it a, uh, uh, is the, you, you explain, actually, let's go back. Let's go back for a minute to your fights with the Department of Environmental Protection. Right. Um, there, there have always been these tensions between the Commerce Department and the in, right. Environment Department, but it's, it's also a matter of commissioner dealing with commissioner. Yes. Yeah. How you dealt with Two of them, yeah, um, Judy, Judy Laskin, Askin and, and, and Scott, Scott Weiner. Scott, who I just saw Scott uh, recently. He's, okay, well, so you're still friend. friends. Yeah. Oh, no, we're definitely good friends, yeah. No, Scott understood. Scott definitely understood. Well, how, t I mean, were, were issues when you dealt with the DEP, were, were issues that really rose to the level of requiring some intervention on your part, were they resolved generally to your yes. satisfaction? Yeah, no, well. It was it was always mutual. I mean, I understood his position. He understood my position, right? We all at the time don't forget that we had a, a basically a tough economy at that time too. So people, you know, needed jobs, and we, we, we were looking at high unemployment, and didn't didn't nobody wanted to be part of that. You know, we wanted to have people have jobs. So we always had a good relationship, no matter what. And and it goes back to what I said before: is that you know if you explain your position to somebody, you know they might not agree with your position, but at least they think you think. I, I want to tell you that, that you asked me, you know, what it's what it's like in the government today. I think it's really changed. I mean, when I was at Commerce, I would you know go down to the Republican leader's uh, office, sit down and just shoot the breeze about stuff, right? You don't seem to have that kind of camaraderie today. I remember Joe Doria, who was, I think, a Speaker of the House at the time, mm -hmm. used to have a lunch, and it, it, would, it would be, uh, you know, good Italian lunch in his office, and there'd be Republicans and Democrats there, right? We'd go down to Lorenzo's after, after work sometimes, and, you know, you would be with people, and even though they were adversaries in the political sense, you don't have the acrimony that you seem to have today. Uh, and I think that's, that's a really big problem. And I think uh, in New Jersey, I mean, if you take it from a management standpoint, you know, um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask, but I think that, you know, uh, we're coming to a day of reckoning, uh, I think, uh, because you can't have these huge uh, cost overhangs and not deal with them. Uh, so, uh, even though at one time I considered that it would be a good thing to try to run for governor, today I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole <laughs> because I don't know what you do with, you know, $80 billion with a, on a $32 billion budget or so, you know, and, and what happens when interest rates go up? Uh, you know, so I don't mean to be pessimistic because I'm not a pessimistic person, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, people have to deal with the way Jim Florio dealt with it, pay as you go, not let somebody else worry about it in the future. I think that's our biggest problem. Something that you just mentioned jogged uh, uh, my memory when you're talking about um, the camaraderie and, and developing relationships with uh, legislators from the other party. Um, a recent interview that I did um, elicited the observation that um, one of the early things that the Florio administration did that um, rubbed people the wrong, of the other party the wrong way was having the state treasurer, Doug Berman, represent all of the departments uh, going before the legislature's appropriations committees uh, on the first budget. So that instead of having commissioners, as you were, yeah, right. going and did. making an argument for your department, it was the state treasurer who was making the argument for how money would be spent. And that that, from this person's perspective, uh, meant that the opportunity for the commissioners, um, the cabinet, 
to develop their own relationships with legislators was foreclosed. Yeah. Would you well, agree in, with that? In hindsight, I do agree with that. I don't, I don't remember whether I, I, I think a couple of times I went there, I don't think I really did talk about my budget, but, but you know. It, well, you certainly didn't in the, back, in the first year. Yeah, uh, it comes back to more about the relationships, right? I mean, uh, I think in hindsight, and this is clearly hindsight, um, you know, better communications would have gone a long way toward uh, reducing the amount of impact that, that, uh, the, that, it, that it had on Jim. I mean, Jim should have been elected to a second term. He wasn't because of, in my opinion, uh, the, the communication gap that existed uh, during that period. Um, because I think what he was doing was right and could have convinced people that it was right. Today, I think people recognize smart people. I, mean, I think recognize. I don't know. I should. I shouldn't say things like that. But I think they do recognize it. Um, from your vantage point today, as more of a elder statesman at this point. Yeah, um, I don't know about that. Again, going back to the question I was right. going to finish up with, which is your own observations of state government in New Jersey, how it functions, um, how it's structured. Um, aside from, as, as you've pointed out, the, the sort of this, the the, uh, uh, the financial, the great financial difficulties that are confronting the state, do you think that it's a well-run state? Do you think that the folks who work in state government are um, are good people? Do you think that uh, there are ways in which structurally the state uh, should function differently? Um, Look, I think the people that go into government, uh, by and large, want to do a good job and have their heart is in the right place. Um, I think structurally, however, the way that it's evolved over time um, is not good. Um, you know, I'll say that you know, uh, there's so much focus today uh, on control out of the governor's office that it's not, I don't, I don't think it's good. You should let people go and, and do their job. And, you know, and going back over the years, I think you know, previous governors have done that, let people go and do their job. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with what we talked about with the acrimony that is prevalent today in politics, just generally. Uh, so, you know, look, um, I'm never going to be pessimistic about our state. I love the state. Uh, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, it's structurally got some issues. Mm. Tell us. Uh, I'm so, as diplomatic I, as I, I can be. I, I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm still, no, and still optimistic. <laughs> it's, um, tell us what you're doing today. What, what, well, I, I, I just, mean, you're doing a zillion things, I'm doing but a zillion if, you things. Could, if you could focus right. it in on a handful. Well, one of the most interesting things I did was uh, about uh, 12 years ago, I got involved with uh, Virgin group um, in London, um, Richard Branson's company. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, at the time that I got involved, Richard Branson was not involved. Um, we, um, we uh, you know, as I said, I, I was in the stress debt business, um, meaning I, I buy debt uh, that is either close to bankruptcy or going toward bankruptcy, restructure and, and uh, try to make money at it. Um, and um, we have, have a number of uh, projects that I've done, uh, but the most interesting one is, was the Virgin project. Uh, we bought a company that uh, called NTL was in bankruptcy uh, and restructured it um, with uh, a, a number of hedge funds and uh, including, you know, Michael Price's company was involved also. Uh, and um, uh, we uh, sold it to John Malone's company uh, about two years ago. Um, did extremely well, but I, I chaired the audit committee for 10 years. Uh, there, um, which was a very interesting thing because it's multinational. It's got a lot of different businesses uh, and was a lot of work, uh, but you know, very very rewarding from a personal standpoint. Um, you know, met a lot of very good people. Guys, I just got back. I, I mentioned that I was in Belfast. I just got back from playing five days of golf with my friends from Virgin in Belfast, uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, so. I wish I'd interviewed you was. before this. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> you could come in, right? We could uh, do it. There you go. Uh, um, so I did that. Uh, you know, I'm on the board of New Jersey Resources. Uh, I've been, I've been the longest, I'm the longest serving board member. I think I've been on there. I was a very young guy when I went on there. Um, I think 20 years. And Larry Downs, who's the uh, president, is absolutely mm -hmm. one of the best managers I've ever seen in business. 
um, just a great guy and has a very successful track record. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've, I've, I've been on a number of other boards, uh, including a bank board in Omaha, a music company in Ohio, uh, I can tell you, a, a railroad company in Southern Florida, the uh, Florida East Coast Railway oh. I was on that board. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of things like that. And, uh, and meanwhile, I've still got a private equity company that does investments in um, basically medium-sized companies. Mm -hmm. That uh, you know, are you still on the board of governors here at Rutgers? No, I was. I did six years, mm -hmm. I think, six years of that. Um, and then they realized you were from Penn State and kicked you off, is it? And, they, and then uh, Penn State <laughs> awarded me the Distinguished Alumni Award ah, uh, about three years for ago. For leaving the Rutgers about Board About three of years ago. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much involved now with Penn State. Um, you know, um, the new president, uh, who really had a task in front of him. Oh, indeed. You talk about crisis management. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Barron is, is a, a friend, and he's a very, very capable, good guy that has... I think tremendous ideas, and you know, I think the school is uh, hopefully turning the corner. Although, you know, most people judge that about their football team, which, well, I, which I, I'm dead set <laughs> against. You know, I once had when I used to used to be on the board of governors of Rutgers, and they would talk a lot about this uh, expansion of all this athletic stuff and everything else. I said, one thing I've never asked a person in an interview for a good job is how what, what the record of their football team was, mm -hmm. and I really believe that. I say, I think we've spent far too little attention on the academic side. And even at big schools like Penn State and, you know, mm. Michigan and Ohio State, far too much emphasis on... Uh, on there, there was a very interesting article in the sports pages of the New York Times this week uh, by a sports columnist basically saying after Rutgers got uh, mm. one of the worst defeats it's ever had at the hands of the University of Michigan, that, uh, that people who are looking at the scoreboard... Um, as, as an indicator of Rutgers' decision to join the Big Ten are looking at the wrong score. Yes. And I thought that was a very you, interesting you know, way of putting it. And you are so <laughs> right about that. And, you know, we still, uh, you know, my, my wife has uh, got a master's degree and an undergraduate degree from Rutgers. My daughter has a master's degree and an undergraduate degree from Rutgers. And as and I recall, she is ran the, the cheerleading she, I was going to say, she ran the cheerleading. She yeah, does. Does she still do that? For 20 years. Oh, my yeah, gosh. For 20 years. <laughs> uh, she's, uh, in, and uh, she is very enthusiastic about the new management at the athletics. And, you know, she was so despondent. Um, and now hates Harbor because he went for two. She doesn't even know. <laughs> she doesn't even know. I'm telling you, Christine does not even know, but he went for two. Yeah, well, and, and I wonder how many people who are going to watch this or read the transcript of it are going to understand what that reference is all about. Right. I do, because yes. I was at the game. Right. Um, all right, final question. What, what should I have asked you that I didn't? Or what uh, observation would you want to make to sort of finish well, this all off? Let me just say what Jim Florio's legacy should be. Um, you know, I, I really believe that he is truly one of the most thoughtful, um, most competent governors that we've had. He, his, his legacy should be that he did what was right at the time, but also with an understanding that maybe today we put far too much emphasis on the personality and the outreach ability and the marketing of our governors than we should. That it should be more on the basis of did they go in, did they work hard, did they care, and did they only care about the state of New Jersey? And Jim did. And I think that's his legacy.